one of the largest, one of the top uh, global blockchain uh, companies. It has also been hit hard by COVID-19, the global pandemic, and uh, I read that you had to lay off some 14% of the staff. Now, you who are in fintech, in the fintech business of consensus, how hard has the impact been on your side? Uh, starting off with easy questions. So it's, uh, of course, all, all businesses globally have been uh, impacted by COVID and in particular, that's, that's had an impact on um, innovation budgets for financial services institutions. It's had an impact on uh, venture investors in terms of um, where they shore up their portfolios and things of that nature. You know, I think for us, consensus has been on a uh, restructuring uh, journey for the last year where we have transitioned from uh, a blockchain venture studio model with lots and lots of individual product uh, projects that that are venture funded towards a uh, software business and so uh, selecting the product bets that we are uh, confident in investing in those product bets investing in those clients and so we uh, yeah, you know, I think these things happen simultaneously as we were pivoting the business, um, and you know, like like all uh, fintechs and blockchain companies out there, we we've, we've uh, needed to right size for both the opportunity and the economy. But we feel fairly strongly about um, our position today, uh, and actually, much of the COVID impact has been to raise the need for digital infrastructure for both payments uh, and markets and value settlement. And I think those themes have made it much more obvious that you need things like um, central bank digital currencies or universal basic income or uh, accounting of, of small business loans. And I think that longer term is helping the thesis that we have. Let's quickly talk about Ethereum, Lex. Uh, I've had the pleasure to interview your founder, Joe Lubin, at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2018. That was kind of the honeymoon period of uh, cryptocurrencies. But since then, over the last two years and a half, we've seen such wild market swings. What are your plans with uh, Ethereum? Because right now it is still number two after Bitcoin when it comes to the ranking in the world's uh, cryptocurrency space, right? Sure. Um, and, you know, it, it, it'll be fantastic to be number two. Um, it'll be fantastic to be number one. I think the, the asset price, to me at least as an operator, is it doesn't hold that much information. You know, so um, whether things go up and down is, is very much, uh, you know, in large part speculative. And so... I think Bitcoin and Ethereum have very, very different use cases where uh, the Bitcoin use case, and I think it's very well established, and I'm a big fan of that asset, is to be um, a store of value digitally. If you, you know, if you, it, 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 let's forget about it's uncorrelated or, or anything else. Let's forget the story about central banks and just say five to 10% of my portfolio needs to sit in a um, store of value, which is correlated with technological progress, and it's an alternative in my in my portfolio. And Bitcoin has been in production across millions and millions of accounts now for 12 years. Um, it is cryptographically secure, and I think it's fantastic. Um, Ethereum is very, very different. Uh, Ethereum is like some combination of, you know, Amazon's cloud uh, and... Uh, a new type of thinking about identity and financial infrastructure. So, so why would an investor invest in Ethereum rather than Bitcoin? Why would somebody invest in um, like wood or app, like raw materials like timber versus buying Apple stock? They're just completely different. Um, Ethereum is for computation. So it's for, it's for writing software. And the metric that I look at is... Um, how many contract calls are made on Ethereum? And a contract call is like, so you run software on your computer and it executes and it, you know, it can ping a server and say, give me this data. So that's kind of like a contract call. So on Ethereum today, there's uh, 
two million contract calls per day and growing. And that just means that more and more software is written on Ethereum. There's now about $10 billion worth of value of cash equivalents that is traveling through Ethereum in order to pay for this software. Uh, there's about two billion in, this is in US dollar denominated, there's about two billion of collateralized loans on Ethereum that are powering various financial infrastructure. And so for me, what's really interesting about it isn't the price of Ether, it is the types of software for financial activity that is written into Ethereum itself. Bitcoin has one thing it does, which is unit of value, right, that you move back and forth. With Ethereum, you, you can write any piece of software and execute it on the network. And so they're, they're just very different, but complementary. The last thing I'll say on that is there's actually quite a few projects which are taking Bitcoin value and they're moving it over to the Ethereum blockchain. So you take your Bitcoin and you send it to an address on the Bitcoin blockchain where it gets locked up or disappears or goes in escrow. And then on the Ethereum blockchain, it appears as a structured product, essentially. And so the value that is sort of stuck within the Bitcoin network, because you can't, you can't do functional things with it, um, you can now transfer onto the Ethereum chain and actually put into software and use for services and things like that. So I think they're very complementary. You should have both. So, Lex, uh, you just earlier talked about uh, the investment into the fintech industry is uh, drying up. And, of course, that applies to all investment areas uh, for 2020. So, where are the areas in fintech that are still making money? Sure. So, I think, um, you know, there was this narrative about venture capital um, in a COVID environment where, you know, if you have a portfolio of maybe 20 projects, you have to say, these are my top two projects and I'm going to give them my, the money that I've saved for follow on investment. I'll give that to them now to make sure that they survive. And then the, the projects that are maybe not losers yet, but are kind of in the middle, I'm not going to be able to fund. And that's, that's, that was the venture capital narrative. I think the, the numbers came out recently from CB insights for FinTech venture funding. And it, it doesn't look, it looks down maybe 20, 30%, you know, it's not down 80 or 90%. So it's, it's down a little bit. Um, you know, in terms of what what should the future be, or, or where should that uh, money go? Yeah, so I'm I'm a big fan of um, uh, I think lending and payments are the core cash flow um, areas in fintech. This is because if in a in a lending in a lending um, in a lending company, you essentially get paid immediately, so the revenues are recognized immediately. So very often, those are those are seen as uh, favorable businesses, although they're complicated in the long run. Um, and then payments businesses tend to have pretty good economics. And so I think if you are a conservative fintech investor, those are the most cash flow generating. I think if you're looking at things a little bit more longer term, this is where the, the digital banking and the digital investing companies come in. Um, and I think there's a, there's a lot of investment going into neobanks, into digital payments apps right now. So if you look at things like Revolut or SoFi, so, uh, SoFi is applying for a national banking uh, license. I think those are longer term plays that are, that are seeing more investment uh, uh, sort of with from investors who have a time horizon that is maybe three to five years. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about China as well, Lex. So blockchain development is one of the key priorities for the central government there. And uh, it is receiving a lot of backing, of course, from the private sector, innovation, research and development, startups, the whole ecosystem. How do you see the competition between the United States and China when it comes to a blockchain? I think um, I'm excited to see the competition. It's important to have the competition because without the competition, literally nothing would happen in the West at all. Um, the there is, um, I think, in the in the in many jurisdictions in the West, not all. I think actually Europe and the UK is a little bit simpler and more friendly to um, to blockchain. 
but the the approach which is taken from a regulation perspective is called the technology neutral approach which means that you just regulate the assets the way you would, you would regulate securities the way you regulate securities whether they are on a blockchain or whether they are in a database or on a piece of paper and so this means that um a number of concepts that just don't really apply to blockchain based assets end up preventing innovation and, and moving forward and so I'm very excited to see the type of pressure that comes from global competition, whether it's from the, you know, the Chinese blockchain services network or whether it's the digital yuan or whether it's Facebook Libra. I think these are good points for pressure to, to drive people to create new systems and innovation. Um, I do think there is a uh, somewhat unhelpful but uh, blocking global narrative right now around surveillance and data. Um, and there's no way to get around that issue. I, th I think we're going to spend the next two decades negotiating what it means to share data, what it means to have artificial intelligence, um, what it means to have personal identity and who has control over data. Um, and I think this will spill over into blockchains very much because blockchains take data and they encode it forever into the, the, the fabric of your uh, database, of, of your ledger. Um, and so for me, I think the adjacent to just the blockchain competition is the question around data, which you can see it playing out in the 5G conversation. You'll see it playing out in the driverless car conversation. You'll see it in, in the global trade supply, uh, supply chain conversation. And so I think um, on top of that, COVID has accelerated these issues, right, by um, creating the need for uh, individuals to share their personal data about medical status, you know, and so it's it's kind of this emotional ball in the media right now that's um, creating a lot of complication. You have briefly mentioned uh, the digital yuan. So uh, the People's Bank of China is obviously rolling out uh, the central bank digital currency. Um, are you in touch with the regulators there? And is there any business scope for consensus in China at this point? Uh, I, I don't think I'm not aware of anything that consensus is doing with PBOC um, as, as far as I'm aware um, we we do business globally um, so we have a hub in New York a hub in London Paris and um, a dozen other locations throughout the world including um, Hong Kong I think we're also present in Singapore uh, and Japan and so we are active in the region you know we'd love to talk to folks who are who are working on um, either digital asset or CBDC solutions. We think that Ethereum infrastructure is fantastic uh, for CBDCs, primarily because it is, in, it is open source. Um, and this is something that people, um, I think, I'm not gonna say ignore, but, but maybe misunderstand. So lots of private developers um, have contributed their code into an open source repository, you know, so like IBM Fabric is part of Hyperledger. Um, some parts of our three Corda are open source. Um, but there is a, I, and I don't know for, for Tencent or, or Alibaba whether their chains are, you know, partially open source as well. But Ethereum is open source in the way that Linux is open sourced in that there is, um, you know, dozens of thousands of developers contributing code for free into a place where everybody can uh, can fork it and use it. Um, and so there's just a really strong, there's a huge power in that. There's no vendor lock-in, you know, you, you're able to use this resource. Um, and so it's just the, the final example of that is, um, you know, Elon Musk sending the, the rocket to the ISS. That rocket was run on Linux operating software. It, it was on the operating system. It wasn't run on Windows or iOS or anything else. It was run on Linux. And so, you know, my hope is that Ethereum is seen in the same way as a global uh, operating system for financial infrastructure. And when it comes to, uh, you know, financial infrastructure and payment infrastructure, are you in touch, uh, in discussions with any Chinese players at the moment, be it uh, and financial or Tencent or Huawei or Baidu, or not at this point in time? So we, we talk with lots of folks. Uh, uh, I can't say who in particular, but we've, you know, we, spoke, we speak globally with uh, the world's largest financial organizations. And if we haven't, we'd love to. Um, 
I think there is a strong national interest in China to to have homegrown <clears throat> fintech and blockchain solutions. Um, and I think the key vector of cooperation is interoperability. You know, so for example, if I'm BlackRock and I want to move a trillion dollars um, from one geography to another, how do I do that? Let's let's not say a trillion. Let's maybe say ten billion, right? I want to do a ten billion dollar trade of treasuries. Um, the blockchain rails to do this should be seamless and interoperable, and so. That's something for us as consensus. We think about a lot is how do you, um, how do you not create these different uh, environments and different standards, but have open interoperability that anyone can use. So for the Chinese central bank digital currency, so here uh, we're just the test piloting, but there is a potential situation uh, when it goes down fully onto the blockchain. Currently, we don't know if it's going to go on blockchain or not. But if it goes onto blockchain to be able to process billions of transactions within nanoseconds, the speed is an issue because you need yeah. all these verifications on blockchain. How do you solve the speed issue? This is an absolute real issue. Um, totally acknowledge it. Um, there are a couple of comments. I'll make two directional comments. The first is there are two types of uh, CBDCs. One is retail, where each one of us has uh, a direct account with a central bank, and then one is wholesale, where just the financial institutions do. Yeah, so wholesale is much more realistic on today's systems. Um, and we don't have to pick the hardest case to start with. We can, we can pick the easier case, and then when the software is better, we can pick the, the harder case. Um, that said, there are a number of what are called layer two solutions, which build on top of the, the underlying chain, um, which could enable lots and lots of transfers, but they probably are not yet performant for you know, all of China, for all of retail CBDCs. Um, but then number two is, if you think back again to the early 2000s, do you remember a company called Real Player? I don't know if you yeah. remember. So, so Real Player was trying to do internet video in 2003, and it was terrible. It was installing on your desktop. It was full of ads. It was very slow. It was low, low, low bandwidth. Lots of sparks and viruses. Oh God. So basically, this is where we are with uh, digital currencies today. The bandwidth isn't fast enough. The way that you know, there was no fiber in 2002. You couldn't play endless videos uh, streaming at full quality. It just what the bandwidth wasn't there. That doesn't mean the bandwidth never comes. It, it meant that at that time it wasn't there. Um, the concept of cloud wasn't there, right? So all your software was on your computer, on your, de on your desktop. Um, clouds had to be built up over time and those were economic creatures from Google and from Amazon in response to e-commerce and, and uh, a developing native internet economy. And so again, that took a decade after Real Player. And so I think when we look at blockchain-based infrastructure, we're going to see a similar, um, a similar path where the concepts today are all interesting and probably correct, but the, the underlying plumbing still will take time to develop. But that doesn't mean the concepts are wrong. It just means that we're, we might be a little bit early. Uh, give us a realistic uh, assessment, please, Lex. You look at uh, end financial. <laughs> you look at end financial. You look at WeBank. Give us a sense of how far ahead China is or if China is not at all. That's a great and very difficult question. Um, I think the West, um, and especially, I think the, the Western financial players very much recognize how good China has become at um, combining digital payments and native mobile banking with um, large tech footprints. Um, definitely a unique strength and something that you actually see the West starting to try and replicate. I think the core difference is that um, in the West, in Silicon Valley, um, there is very strong regulation that prevents Google and Amazon and Facebook from issuing financial product. Uh, you know, so for example, if Google were to offer 
trading, they would poison the rest of their business, all of it. They would have to not cease the rest of their business, but essentially break all of their, all of their business. And so when you look at the, um, the value of something like uh, Google or, or Apple, which is approached with you know, trillion dollar companies um, versus the, Apple of Gold, the, the value of Goldman Sachs, which is 60 billion, nobody wants to be Goldman Sachs. It's a tiny company. I'd much rather be Apple. You know, and so I think the tech companies in the U.S. have been much slower to move out of media and the social networking and search and touch financial products. They're doing it, but at the core of high tech in the U.S. is media, engagement, and entertainment and not finance. And I think what um, is different in the East is that financial identity and the ability to pay and the ability to have bank account and ability to get credit is is at the at the core and then the super apps have functionality built around that outside right so you bring your financial identity to uh transportation or to media or to and so the model is flipped um the fintechs in the the west are never going to be able to catch up with the end financials because they'll never get that media scale because that's already a um that is already a market position that is taken and protected by the actual tech companies. And so they really don't have a chance to be, you know, a 2 billion user footprint uh, type company. So I do think um, there's some really fantastic innovations in Asian FinTech that um, both can't be replicated in the West, but can be inspiration for a lot of different companies. It's a very bold statement, but would you even say that the West is becoming a fintech copycat of China and the East. Uh, I I would not say that. Um, I would say some some aspects of those companies definitely inspire uh, Western fintechs, but it's not it's not a copycat because it can never it can never aspire to be the same. Yeah, it just it's a very different fit, you know. So will China ever have a standalone Facebook and a standalone JP Morgan or Visa? Probably not. Uh, in the same way that, um, you know, um, the U.S. is never really going to have an ant, like Facebook's never going to become an ant financial no matter how much they want to be. And so I think it's just different ecosystems for different types of markets. But I would say that, um, again, the super apps in the East are um, more innovative than a lot of what fintech is doing in the west they're 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 taking more risks in their business model and they're taking risks that i think are more interesting um but that's also because they can you know there there is more space in which to innovate whereas in the west it's a fairly the system is very saturated so it's you have to be much more niche uh next uh, no companies or uh, tech uh, stays on top of its ladder forever in a the cycle of development. Where would the next threat come from to companies like uh, and financials of the world? Oh, that's a fantastically difficult question. Um, I do think that the three platform shifts that we're looking at are the ones that everybody's talking about, which is blockchain, artificial intelligence, and then um, kind of the augmented reality cycle, which has not yet fully hit. Uh, so I think we're we're maybe two thirds of the way into the artificial intelligence cycle, and then blockchain's a little bit behind that. And then I think augmented reality is is very far away; it's just getting started. It's it's not uh, not very far. I do think that the and financials are well positioned for uh, these trends. Um, so it's hard for me to to see those as attacking its market position. I think what can really attack the market position of all these companies is really if open source um, uh, decentralized finance takes off. You know, so t today decentralized finance um, is looking like 200,000 users. Uh, it's looking like 2 billion in assets. So some people may see that as small, but I think if it continues to be large and free, um, then that has a real chance to, to impact not just Ant Financial, but a lot of business models around the world. 
one last uh, question from my end, uh, at least Alex. Uh, we're both uh, blue collar workers today. This is uh, the blue of consensus. Now, you're also um, a man of color in the sense that you're also an artist. You do a lot of visual art and uh, a lot of new media as well. What are your plans? A non technical question for you. Uh, absolutely. So it's uh, I've got a little bit of a split personality between as you can see my background between uh, finance and um, sort of the hard-nosed economic stuff and then design and the visual arts and uh, a passion of mine is uh, using uh, abstraction and using code in order to, to generate interesting visual images and especially with um, you can now use artificial intelligence pretty easily to, to create imagery. Um, you can use generative art and, and algorithms to, to create interesting imagery. Um, and so I have a, a number of projects that I'm working on, although uh, there, there's very little time to, to build them. Uh, but the next project that I have in mind is uh, to use a neural network to style um, uh, screenshots of, uh, from Google Earth. So you take from Google Earth, you know, beautiful mountain ranges or rivers or like this, tech, this rich texture um, and try to apply different uh, neural network styles on top. So that's my next project. This sounds so cool, but again, at the intersection between art and technology always.